In this chapter, the textbook discusses uh, hardware and software, which are very, very important as far as being a part of an MIS. Remember, the hardware and software are the first two components of the five components of an MIS. This uh, lecture is going to deviate a little bit from the, uh, the chapter in the textbook. It's going to give you a little bit of history of the personal computer and other computers in general. And uh, part of this you will not be tested on, but uh, you will be tested on you know, the information that's in the book. But there's some very good information I think that you'll enjoy here. Well, for our purposes, we're going to define a computer as a device that stores, retrieves, and manipulates information. And as we learn a little bit about the history of the computer, we're going to kind of go beyond the box that you may have right now and realize that a computer does not really have to be electronic. Well, using our definition of a computer, the first computer was actually designed and built in the 1800s by Charles Babbage. Charles Babbage was a British mathematician. A machine very similar to what you see here was actually used in the United States to compute the 1880 census. Now, of course, when most of us think computer, we think electric. Now, the first electronic computer was created in 1945. It was the ENIAC. It was created for the Department of Defense, and it was used to do defense calculations. From the ENIAC sprang a company called UNIVAC, which some of you may have heard of. For the next several years, computers became very popular, but they were mainframe or multi-user computers. These are the computers that you remember seeing, perhaps seeing at work or seeing in the movies where they take up a whole room or a whole floor. Mainframe computers were very, very expensive. Well, in the late 70s, 1976, 1977, finally we had something called the personal computer. Personal computer meaning that one person, one computer. The Apple was the first personal computer that you could purchase in a non-kit form. Before that, engineers and hobbyists could purchase computers in a kit form, but the Apple was the first one available, completely put together at a retail store. The Apple computer was an immediate success with engineers and scientists. It didn't really become a business success until they came out with a program called VisiCalc. VisiCalc was a spreadsheet program that allowed accountants to play with numbers quite a bit. Then it became very successful. And as anything that a successful does, it breeds competition. And so between 1977 and 1983, everybody and their brother, it seems, came out with a new computer. Many of you have probably heard of the Commodore 64. The Commodore 64 was introduced in the early 80s, and it is still to date the most successful computer introduced. Not that uh, the IBM computer hasn't sold more, but the IBM had different models. One individual model, the Commodore 64, sold over 20 million computers. That's just a few of the computers that were introduced during this time period. There are many, many more. Many of you probably didn't realize that there were so many different kinds of computers, and that's just this, that. They were different kinds of computers. They were not compatible. If I had an Atari and my friend had a Commodore, we couldn't share information, we couldn't share programs. What makes a computer compatible with another is the operating system. And at this point, most of these computers had different operating systems. Up to this point, the largest computer manufacturer in the world, IBM, had stayed out of the personal computer market. They were convinced that it really wasn't going to work and everybody really was going to continue to use mainframe computers. However, they realized that the PC really was really going to succeed. And so in 1981, they introduced their own personal computer, which was called the IBM PC. By the summer of 1983, we had everybody and their brother having a computer that they thought was better than sliced bread and they wanted it to become the standard. It's kind of like the VHS and the Beta or the Blu-ray and the HD DVD. Eventually, one emerges as the standard. They were all trying to become the standard and what we really had as a standard was the IBM PC. And this all kind of happened in the summer of 1983. Many of the computer manufacturers started to go bankrupt. 
When IBM got ready to introduce their PC, they decided that they did not want to use the operating system that was becoming the standard CPM. They wanted their own operating system. They liked the way CPM worked, but they wanted it to be different enough that they could call it their own, their IBM operating system. So they tried to contract with the manufacturers of CPM, digital research, but they were not able to come to terms. And so as a result, they ended up contracting with a very small company called Microsoft, who was owned by Bill Gates. Bill Gates didn't have an operating system at the time, but he quickly bought a company, converted the operating system to meet IBM specifications, but he actually outsmarted IBM in some ways because he said, okay, if you're going to allow people to make copies of your machine, then I want them to buy the copy DOS, or the operating system for these copies, from me. And so IBM PCs came with IBM DOS, and Microsoft sold MS-DOS to all the competing machines. Just as the Apple became successful with accountants by a spreadsheet called VisiCalc, Lotus 123 was introduced for the IBM by a competing company, an independent software vendor, and it became a huge success because it drove the IBM into a, a world of accounting that the other computers that were out there were not able to reproduce at that time. So the Lotus 123 software is very much responsible for the success of the IBM PC. Well, today, everybody and their brother still makes PCs, but that's the difference. They're not their own PCs. They are compatible with the IBM. A few years ago, when you purchased a computer, it almost always said IBM compatible. Today, it doesn't even say that. It simply says Windows or a Mac. Windows meaning, essentially, that it is an IBM compatible computer. And an interesting side note, in the summer of 2007, Microsoft still sells lots and lots of operating systems, Windows in this case, but IBM no longer sells personal computers. So Microsoft and Bill Gates became very, very, very wealthy over just a little bit of an operating system. Now, IBM is still a successful company, but they no longer make personal computers. As you're going to see clearly depicted in the video that you're going to watch near the end of the semester here, uh, Wozniak and Jobs, the uh, founders of Apple and uh, Bill Gates, really didn't get along even, even before the Apple computer was actually created. And that battle still rages today. And many of you who will be familiar with the commercials, I'm a Mac and I'm a PC. And even within uh, this particular classroom, there's some of you that are geared uh, themselves to Macs and some of you that gear themselves to PCs. But really, as to wondering who's actually going to win this battle, uh, there's a dark horse that we really haven't talked about too much. And that, that dark horse is actually the Android operating system, or Google. And uh, if you actually look at the number of units sold, Google is actually outpacing both the PC and the Apple I.O. system at that point. So this is, um, that is definitely something to consider, is that uh, in a few years we may all be using Androids instead of um, Apples or uh, PCs. All right, we're now going to go over the basic elements of a computer system. The most basic and important component of a computer system is the central processing unit, the CPU. The CPU does all the processing, all the calculations, all the math, and it is very, very, very much essential for the computer. A computer cannot function without a CPU. Well, hopefully, most of you are medical office students, so I haven't offended you too much with this illustration here, but the CPU by itself is really kind of worthless. It's kind of like what you see here, a brain in a jar. And now, a brain in a jar doesn't do very much. You have to connect it to other things, of course, other parts of the body. And that's what we're going to do now. We're going to connect other parts of our computer to the CPU to make it functional. Now, the CPU is probably closer to the brain stem rather than the entire brain and the human anatomy. But in this case, we're going to attach a different part, and that other part we're attaching to our brain, our CPU, is memory. We have to be able to remember things. The CPU really can't remember much. Now, we have two kinds of memory. We have RAM and ROM. RAM stands for random access memory. ROM stands for read-only memory. The important part of the memory for us is RAM. That's the usable workspace. But unfortunately, RAM is temporary. If the power goes off, whatever's in RAM goes away. It's kind of like if you uh, tried to get a phone number for somebody and you didn't have a pencil and a paper handy and you just repeated the number several times, several times, and then you're getting ready to dial the phone, but somebody said, you know, hey, so-and-so, and 
you talk to them for a few minutes and you go back, you forgot the phone number. That's the way RAM works. So RAM is great for working, but it's not good for permanent storage. So just as we humans have to write things down to remember things, we also need to write things permanently, or at least more permanently, into something called storage. Storage remembers something when the power goes off. And now storage may be a CD or a DVD, it could be a flash drive, or it could be a hard drive or a zip drive or a floppy. But storage is much more permanent than memory. Well, at this point we have the brain, the CPU, we have memory, both permanent and volatile or temporary with the RAM, but we need a way to get the information into the computer and get information out of the computer. We do that with peripherals or input-output devices. That would include things like mice and keyboards and monitors and printers. Two very broad terms you'll hear are hardware and software. Hardware is the computer equipment. The CPU, the printer, the keyboard, the mouse, Everything that you can kind of tap on, uh, the plug-in, that becomes computer hardware. Peripherals, as well as the main system box, are hardware. Software are the programs that make the computer do certain things. We talked a little bit about operating system. The operating system controls how we and the computer communicate. Well, an operating system by itself doesn't to do too much. You want to do things like word processing and spreadsheets and accounting and play games. All of those require different software programs. So the software are the programs that make the computer do things. Well, let's talk a little bit about bits and bytes. Now, don't need to worry about this too much. This is just to kind of just for you know, FYI kinds of things. But the most basic thing about a computer is that it is electrical. And electricity has only two states. Electricity is either on or it's off. Think about a light bulb, on or off. Now within our memory and our CPU, we're processing essentially thousands and perhaps millions, in some cases billions, of switches. These switches have a value either on or off. If it's on, we could assign it a value of 1. If it's off, we could assign it a value of 0. Now if we take a group of switches together, we can then do calculations, or we can assign a group of codes like on, off, on, on, off, the letter A, much like Morse code. We actually call that code ASCII. But we're able to do math with bits. So a bit is simply a 0 or a 1. Byte is a term you'll hear a lot around computers, and it's simply a unit of measure. It actually equates to 8 bits. And in the old days, it could be equated to one character, although that's changed a lot now, and it's not even quite one character. But just like if I ask you how far away you live from Rocky Mountain Business Academy, you would tell me, oh, it's X number of miles. If I ask you how much does your gas tank hold, you would say, well, it holds 52 gallons. Well, that would take a whole lot to fill up. But anyway, we're used to different kinds of units of measure. And so the basic unit of measure for both memory and storage within a computer is a byte. And a byte just happens to be 8 bits. Within computers, especially today, we're dealing with lots and lots and lots of bytes. If, for instance, we had a computer that had a memory of only 4 bytes, that would be roughly four letters. That would not be very many bytes, or we could not load very many instructions into a four-byte memory. And so we're dealing with hundreds, thousands, millions, and billions of bytes. And so some of the prefixes that you want to be familiar with are kilo, which means thousand. Kilobytes would be 1,000 bytes. Don't see that too much anymore. That's kind of small by today's standards. Megabytes, you'll see a lot. When you buy a flash drive, it may have a 120 megabyte ca capacity. But we see most commonly now gigabytes, gigabytes being 1 billion bytes. A hard drive, for example, today is not uncommon to see 300 to 400 gigabytes. When you buy memory for your camera or your flash drive, you're probably going to buy a 1 or 2 gigabyte memory. We've talked an awful lot about uh, hardware, but uh, software is actually what makes the computer do work. And uh, yes, you have to have the hardware, but uh, the software is very, very important when it comes to an information system. And uh, the rest of this chapter covers uh, using Excel in detail. And if you're struggling at all going through the book, I'm going to suggest very, very strongly that you do use the links that have some videos that I've got out there on my website for how to use Excel and do some basic elements within Excel. Uh, there is an Excel exercise to do as well, and if you need any help, please give me a holler and uh, let me know, but uh, I would recommend very strongly that you take a look at those videos.